Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Harry Ransom Center. Those of you who are in our auditorium today and many of you who are joining us virtually, um, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for what's going to be a really spectacular talk from Peggy Ellis. Um, it is really, uh, my name is Ellen Cunningham Krupa and I'm the Associate Director for Preservation and Conservation here at the Ransom Center. And it's a huge pleasure for me to introduce Peggy Holman Ellis today. Peggy is the Eugene Thaw Professor Emerita of Paper Conservation at the Conservation Center at the Institute of Fine Arts at, in New York University. She taught conservation treatment and technical connoisseurship of works on paper there for 35 years. She planned and led the Thaw Conservation Center at the Morgan Library and Museum from 1998 to 2017. Other museum affiliations Peggy has include the Me Metropolitan Museum of Art from 1976 to 1998. She's a fellow and former president of the American Institute for Conservation, a fellow and former council member of the International Institute for Conservation, and an accredited conservator restorer of the Institute of Conservation. Her professional and academic awards are many, including the American Institute for Conservation's President's Award in 2022 for leadership, the AIC Keck Award in 2003 for teaching excellence, and the AIC Gettens Merit Award in 1997 for professional service. She um, held the American Academy in Rome Fellowship in 1994 and the, the uh, Getty Conservation Institute Guest Scholar Residency in 2015. Uh, currently, Peggy's in Houston, uh, serving as the, De the Domineal Drawing Institute feather, uh, fellow, feather, fellow for 2023. Peggy has published and lectured on artists from Raphael, Durer, and Titian to Samaras, Lichtenstein, and De Buffet, among others. She's the author of the book Historical and she's the editor, excuse me, of the book Historical and Philosophical Issues and the Conservation of Works of Art on Paper which was published by uh, the Getty Institute in 2014. And she's the author of The Care of Prints and Drawings, published by Roman Littlefield with the second edition um, coming out in 2017. Both of these books are really core reading for the field of paper conservation. Her research on artists' materials encompass day glow, day, day glow colors, magic markers, and Crayola crayons. In addition to pursuing the computational characterization of pre-machine European papers, she's studying the materials of Willem de Kunig and developing a system for quantifiably describing white paper, a real conundrum in our field, believe it or not. Peggy holds a BA in art history from Barnard College, Columbia University, and an MA advanced certificate in conservation from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. Please join me in welcoming Peggy Ellis. Well, thank you, Ellen. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, Ellen, for inviting me. I want to uh, acknowledge our in-person audience this evening, especially the Ransom Center, Center uh, members for coming out. Uh, thank you for your loyalty and support of this incredible center. And I want to say a special hello to our online viewers. Um, I wish I could reach out and touch all of you. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> I'm very eager to share with you the story of how I became involved with the study of Leonardo's papers and some of the very exciting discoveries that we've made along the way. But as you listen uh, to my adventure, I hope that you'll keep in the front of your mind that the most important aspect of my research is the development of a powerful new computational tool that can help scholars better understand a variety of works on paper, including manuscripts and drawings. More specifically, I am positive that there are some excellent candidates for computational coding among the magnificent holdings of the Harry Ransom Center. The software and the protocols that we've developed for LeoCode can be applied to any pre-machine made paper. 
you? There we are. Here we are. Get used to it. Okay. I'd like to begin with a few comments about how I came to be here and then provide you with some background information about Leonardo and his notebooks and Italian paper making in general during this time, that is the late 15th and early 16th centuries. But first of all, I'm not a Leonardo scholar. I'm a paper conservator. I cannot read Leonardo's famous mirror writing. I cannot understand vernacular Renaissance Italian. And I cannot begin to interpret his genius. In other words, the marks that Leonardo made on his papers, no matter how fascinating, are none of my business. His papers are. And secondly, I am not standing here alone. What I will show you is a result of teamwork. And I want to introduce to you the, Le the Leo Code. Almost five years ago, to the day, I was doing an examination and a condition check of one of Leonardo's notebooks, the Codex Lester. This is the last Leonardo codec codex or notebook remaining in private hands. I had a little light bulb go off of my head while I was standing there in that conservation lab at that museum. The first person I called was Rick Johnson, who you see on your left. Rick is now Professor Emeritus of Engineering at Cornell University. Rick, in turn, almost immediately called Bill Satharis, his colleague, who is a professor of engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The three of us quickly conscripted two tireless and dedicated graduate students, Rushia Lian, who's an engineering uh, PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin, and Abigail Slawick, who's a book conservation student at the Conservation Center Institute of Fine Arts. They have spent almost their entire graduate career working on Leo Code. And when that little light bulb went off in my head, by my side was Frederick Schroeder, who's the caretaker and the curator of the Codex Lester. Based on little more than a hunch, it was Fred who coaxed, pushed, and prodded our team along and opened doors to the very exclusive world of Leonardo scholarship. And it was Fred, later joined by the unstoppable Andrea Clark, keeper of the Codex Arundel at the British Library, who provided the hundreds of digital images necessary for our work. Yes, this entire Leocode project is based upon a hunch. It's based upon the fact that just like each one of us has a unique set of fingerprints, so does every sheet of pre-machine made paper. It has a pattern that was created by the device, in this case a paper making mold, that was used to create it. Unlike humans, however, one sheet of paper can have an identical fingerprint as another sheet of paper that was made from that same mold. As you will see, however, part of the problem is seeing those fingerprints, finding and revealing those patterns. What if we could find a way of revealing the hidden patterns found within inside Leonardo's papers by virtually erasing his writing sketches and diagrams on their surfaces. What might these patterns that are found within the paper itself tell us? Fortunately, because we're dealing with Leonardo, we have a lot of paper to work with. Not only is Leonardo da Vinci, who died a little over 500 years ago, the world's most famous artist, he was also a voracious consumer of paper. Today we have over 4,000 sheets that carry marks made by Leonardo's hand. But it's amazing that even this many survive. After Leonardo's death in 1519, his papers were neglected by his nephew and sole heir, and they languished unattended for years. Gradually, they were dispersed and reassembled by collectors. Today, there are 12 extant notebooks by Leonardo. However, it's debatable how many were actually compiled by him. Today's notion of a notebook is very different 
from the batches of paper that Leonardo would have bought in 25 sheet packets that happened to be called quaderno, which also happens to mean notebook. They were just loosely folded together. As the leading Leonardo scholar Martin Kemp observes, Leonardo's drawings and manuscripts are notably diverse and seemingly disorder disordered. A majority of the surviving sheets were originally separate. Some, like the Codex Arundel, were bound into volumes by later owners. Some were gathered together by Leonardo himself, folded and interleaved, a notebook made perhaps more secure by stitching. The Codex Lester is of this type, but probably not even stitched together by Leonardo. Some sets um, sheets may have been more loosely aggregated in his workshop, perhaps by his assistants. There are also smaller bound volumes, such as the Codex Forester, which served as convenient notebooks uh, of the portable kind. A few of these have survived in something like their original form. Over the centuries, much, less, much more has been lost than survives, and these pages and volumes that do survive have been dispersed, sometimes disbound, sometimes rebound, and sometimes disbound again. A good number of sheets have been trimmed or cut up. Putting Leonardo's 4,000 plus surviving sheets of paper into some kind of order has been a central task of Leonardo scholars ever since his death 500 years ago. And on his own behalf, when Leonardo was in his late 50s, he became increasingly aware that his very fluid modes of thought were not resulting in any sort of workable order. And so, on the first page of the Arendelle that you see on your left here, he confesses, this will be a collection without order, drawn from the many pages that I have copied here, hoping to put them in order in their places according to the subjects with which they will deal. And I believe that before I am at the end of this, I will have to repeat myself many times. And on the verso of the second sheet, the second folio of the Codex Lester, he pauses that farther down on the sheet to warn us. Oops, I'm sorry. On the verso of the second folio of the Codex Lester, he pauses along the way to warn, I shall admit here the proofs that will be presented afterwards in the ordered work, and I shall pay attention only to find cases and inventions, and I shall note them successfully or successively as they present themselves. And then I'll give an order by putting together all of these of the same kind. kind. Therefore, for now, you will not, not wonder, nor will you laugh at me, reader, if there are such big jumps that are made from one matter to another matter. Traditionally, scholars have concentrated on textual evidence for reestablishing affinities between all these scattered sheets and notebooks. For example, is there a mention of a specific datable event? Or is there an identifiable locale that can help in placing for dating and place of origin? Scholars have tracked how Leonardo's distinctive penmanship changed over the years, or the way he arranged his notes on a page. Um, they have, um, in, it, he would intersperse text with illustrations. With a few notable exceptions, scholarship has largely attempted to sort out Leonardo's papers by concentrating on deciphering the marks made on them. But are there perhaps some clues lurking below the surface? The Codex Lester and the Codex Arundel are excellent candidates for computational coding for three reasons. First, this is very quick. First, scholars have determined the portions of the Codex Arundel and the entirety of the Codex Lester were created between 1506 and 1518. Given the intersection of dates, it seems reasonable to conjecture that some of their papers, in fact, may be contemporaneous and possibly procured in batches from a local paper purveyor. This is bolstered by the fact that the two notebooks share 39 examples of three typical Northern European Italian, Northern Italian watermark types. 
And watermarks, for those of you who aren't aware of it, were a type of um, business logo that acted, um, that indicated a certain paper making mill or a certain paper making family. As for the, sorry, good. scholars have proposed that Leonardo intentionally can combine two sets of notes written at different times to form what is today um, the Codex Lester. Given this theory, identical papers should be found clustered in each set, but not shared between them. And finally, the papers of the first 30 pages of the Codex Arundel are particularly intriguing because it appears that they were once in and of themselves a separate notebook, uh, which was only later combined with other Leonardo papers by a collector. So if mole mates were to be found among the 285 sheets that today make up the Codex Arundel, this first section of 30 would be the logical place uh, to look and then following with the other batches found, found later on in the manuscript. As noted already in Leonardo's time, paper bore traces of the way it was made. That is, one sheet at a time was produced by dipping a mold into a vat. not always detectable to the human eye, existed in the distribution of the chain lines and the wire lines across the, sheet, across the mold. When the mold was plunged into the vat of suspended paper pulp and lifted up, the chain and laid wires were impeded the quantity of the pulp as it drained away, leaving behind a grid-like pattern. One by one, each sheet of paper was transferred from a mold onto a growing post of paper. A day's production was processed sequentially and en masse. It was stacked and pressed, dried, sized, finished, graded, and packaged, generally according to a daily or weekly run or until the drying loft, the capacity of the drying loft could only hold so much paper. So it was moved through regularly and it was moved through together. So imagine if you will, imagine if you will, this is a ream of paper for sale in your local staples. Local papers in reams of paper produced by a mill to the well-known phenomenon of identical papers occurring in historic manuscripts and books. And to show you just one example, all 113 sheets of this 16th century Austrian blank ledger book were created using just two papermaking molds. And I should note here that in order to speed up production in a paper mill, the Vatman typically had two alternating molds to form that growing, so that growing post of paper would typically um, um, uh, consist of papers made from, from two molds. But because each mold was handcrafted, it has its own distinctive patterns. Hence, one typically finds uh, two sets of identical papers in a ream of handmade paper. And as book historians will tell you, this is very typical of, of pre-machine made paper in handmade books. Uh, here's the gathering of, of this book. So four sheets of paper. This is very sensitive. Four sheets of paper were selected, folded together, made into a gathering, and then sewn together to make a book. And you see mold A and mold B. Knowing that absolutely identical 
for example, what can mole mates tell us? Mole mates suggest a common place of origin and a very narrow period of production. The production can be either during the production run of that particular mill, which can be days or weeks, or during the lifetime of that one paper making mold. And that can range from six months, well paper historians have told us that can range anywhere from six months to two years, depending on the size of the paper being produced by that particular mill. And you can imagine that a popular size paper, you know, eight, eight and a half by 10 sheet of paper, that mold would have been used a lot more frequently than say an oversized sheet. So that mold would, wouldn't last very long because these, these molds were used continuously. They were wet, they were scrubbed, they were thrown around, they were really not very well treated. So as you will see, the presence of mole mates in Leonardo's notebooks can have several implications. So when we see mole mates occurring in a very close sequence within a manuscript, it may be deduced that the papers are from the same ream and therefore date from a very narrow period of production, that is days or weeks. Isolated mole mates found out of sequence, in other scattered all throughout the manuscript, for example, can only be dated to a broader but still pretty narrow period of time, which would be the lifetime of that mold. Well, how do we go about identifying these mole mates? Paper mole mates formed by the same paper making mold, therefore they have three absolutely identical and unique markers. So here we know that the eagle water mark should appear here, and here we see what we call a denoised image of the, the paper structure, so you can see the eagle. Fortunately, all three of these markers can be coded using pattern recognition or signal processing software, and this was the software that was developed by Rick Johnson and Bill Sitharis. Four of the programs that you're going to see at work here are downloadable for free from the Leo Code website. And the fifth is in development. To transform a watermark into a code, a software program called Watermark Marker measures very specific features of the watermark and reports them in ratios. It doesn't measure their length. It reports them in ratios to each other. The user picks a pair of points that are joined to form lines. Uh, for example, here we see a shears. Uh, we use seven lines. Uh, to code the Shears watermark. Watermark marker then calculates and displays all ratios of those lengths between all the lines, and these form the basis of the code that precisely describes the watermark. Two software programs, Watermark Point Marker and Visualize Overlays, work together to create an animated GIF image of one watermark 
fading into another. And you'll see that on your right. These two shears that you see going in and out on your right do not match. They are not mold mates. And you should be able to see that very clearly. But keep in mind Arendelle Folio 4243 because you're going to see it a little bit later. A, soft line, a software program, chain line marker, records the ratios of the chain lines, the intervals relative to each other across the sheet, and reports them in a chart so you see circled in red. We can then take that data and plot it as a graph. And today, um, and, and this is the Shears watermark. We have uh, six pages uh, with Shears watermarks. They are scattered throughout the 285 folios of the Codex Arendelle. Um, five out of those six were formed from the exact same paper making mold, but today are scattered throughout the, um, the manuscript. But do, the, and, but do note that, that Arendelle 4243 in the orange dotted line is not a mold made to any of them. The other manufactured marker to be found in handmade papers is the unique distribution of the laid lines across the sheet. Laid line density patterns can be mapped and assigned various colors. So as seen here, regions of low density are blue and regions of high density are colored red. And later we're going to see how laid line mapping was able to confirm that the the watermark status of a partial watermark, often you only have a, a fragment to deal with, that could not be used with watermark marker. Now that you have the background information on paper making in Leonardo's time, his disordered practices when it comes to recording his thoughts and his observation and the compilation of his notebooks, which we really don't know very much about, and how moments can be coded according to these three internal features, let's take a look at the patterns that are buried in the pages of the Codex Lester and the Codex Arendelle. Scholars have proposed that Leonardo intentionally combined two sets of notes written at different times. God, this has got a mind of its own. Scholars have proposed that Leonardo intentionally combined two sets of notes written at different times to form what is today the Codex Lester. Given this theory, identical papers should be clustered in one set, but not shared or wandered into the other set. So the Codex Lester consists of 18 loose, full-size, risuta size sheets of paper, which are folded in half and stacked together. And so here you see the 18 sheets that are folded in half and joined together. Scholars have um, poured over the, the, the content of the uh, Codex Lester, trying to, to note uh, Leonardo's cases or, or the topics, the cases as he called them, the way each topic is arranged on the sheet, ink spatters, offsets from one page to another, which would indicate that they were wet when they were folded. The debate continues, but I think the paper itself might give us some clues. Comparison and matching of the codes revealed strings of eagle, flower, and cardinal's hat watermarks. Um, and note that this diagram depicts the codex's current collation. While the original collation is unknown and several ordering theories have been advanced, the, the distribution of mole mates points to affinities between groups of paper at, at the time that they were used by Leonardo. Seen as solid red lines, three out of the four papers having watermarks came from the same paper making mold. The three, three out of the four. The fourth eagle is that probable alternate um, mold sometimes called the twin, but it's a fraternal twin, like my son's. It means that it resembles them closely, but they're not identical. 
seen as purple lines, two out of the three papers having flower watermarks are mole maize. The third, seen as a dashed purple line, is their probable trend. And then finally, seen as green lines out of the 10 sheets having cardinal's hat watermarks, six sheets seen in solid green came from one mold, and four seen as dashed green lines come from a second alternating mold. And I don't know if you're all familiar with cardinal hats. It's a, it's a hat, and it has loose um, strings hanging down, the tassels, those little round things at the bottom of the strings are the, uh, are the, the tassels. So based solely on their sequence, the arrangement of mole mates and their probable twins suggests that Leonardo was drawing from three separate paper sources. Note also that Lester sheet five, seen as a solid black line, has a fleur de lis watermark. This sheet is a singleton and is completely out of order and out of context. But do stay tuned, dear audience, because this fleur de lis is going to reappear in the most unexpected place. <sighs> Turning to British Library Manuscript 263, the Codex Arundel, this, uh, this notebook was compiled from 285 sheets that range in dates from 1478, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just lost my place. Um, yeah, to 1518, thereby it overlaps in time with the Codex Lester. The papers of the first 30 pages of the Codex Arundel are particularly intriguing because it appears that they once made up a separate notebook, which is only later combined uh, with Leonardo's papers, uh, more Leonardo's papers uh, by a collector. So if moments are going to be found, we're going to have to look at this first section. That would be the logical place to look, followed by later editions. Again, the codes produced for all the watermarks found in the first 30 pages of the Codex Arundel, we were able to make an accurate collation chart that supports the theory that these papers were gathered together by Leonardo himself and only later expanded into the Codex Arundel by a collector. As in the Codex Lester, Computational coding revealed mole mates among the cardinal's hat watermarks. The preponderance of cardinal hat watermarks and the configuration of mole mates clearly supports the idea that the sheets came from one batch of paper. The exceptions are one full sheet of a flower watermark seen in pink and a half sheet having a shears watermark seen in orange. And you will recall that the Codex Arundel consists of many more folios than just those sheets intentionally um, gathered together um, here. Could these unexpected insertions of the shears and the flower be mole to sheets found later on in the manuscript? Both the shears and the flower watermarks do have mole elsewhere in the manuscript. And the positions of these two watermarks in the first 30, within the first 30 sheets, might deserve a second look. Do they have something, if you study the marks on the, on the mole mates found later in the manuscript, is there something that ties them together? Perhaps it's worth a second look. The arrangement of cardinal's hat watermarks, however, is not random, and it cannot be um, circumstantial accumulation. Um, in, this, in this one, um, As for the Shears watermarks, folio 18, which was the orange one, if you recall, found inserted in that first section of 30 pages, it is a mold mate to four found elsewhere in the manuscript as seen here. To the right of folio 18, which is the one uh, in the upper left, uh, is another half sheet. Sometimes you get full sheets for the Codex Arundel, and sometimes you only get half sheets. And so the one folio 18 is in the first 30 is a half sheet. Um, but they are mole mates to the three below. But how do we know that? Because the half sheets, folio 18, you see it only has a tiny little, the tips of the blades in the top. There we go. Oh. 
that's what we have. That's what we have to work with. And that's not enough to do your, your watermark marker and, and to, um, uh, you have to rely on the chain line intervals and then that, that, third, that third way of testing, that third marker, the laid line mapping. We saw earlier um, how ley line maps reflect the um, distribution of the pulp according to the frequencies of the, um, the ley lines ac across um, the, the sheet. So that's the other manufactured pattern found in handmade papers. Uh, ley line densities can be mapped and assigned various colors. So for two uh, of the half sheets we see in the upper row, and then we see the ley line density maps for the three full sheets um, in, the bottom, in the bottom row. And because the three in the bottom row had the, the full watermarks, we were able to do the watermark, uh, the watermark matching as well as the chain line matching. But you'll see um, that the ley line maps are very, very similar. If you take Arendelle 18 and 5693 and put them down at the bottom, you'll see that, that they are mold rates. Since half of the sheets in the Codex Arendelle are unwatermarked because it's a quarto, it's a half a sheet that's then folded in half. So approximately half of the sheets that make up the Codex Arendelle won't have any watermarks at all. So we asked ourselves, if Leydine working works with partial or fragmentary watermarks, would it work with unwatermarked sheets? And um, I was, um, in scrolling through 285 transmitted light images of the Arendal folios, I noted the similarity between these two sheets. I know Peggy get a like, but anyway. Um, their chain line intervals were wider and their laid line were quite distinct to me. Well, sure enough, if you look on your right, that's an animated overlay of the two laid line density maps of these two, two sheets. And their chain line intervals um, match exactly. And so I'm gonna give you some time to see that animated overlay of the laid line density map. So we have found mold mates in each of the two separate sets of notes put together to form the Codex Lester. In the first 30 pages of that discrete notebook by Leonardo in the beginning of the Codex Arendelle, we have found that mole mates scattered throughout the remaining 255 folios of the Codex Arendelle, and we found mole mates that are shared between the Codex Lester and the Codex Arendelle and we call these cross-codex moments. So let's have, have a look. Um, this is the, um, the first, thir I'm sorry. This is the Codex Lester. This is very sensitive. So this is sheet one and sheet two. This is the, the separate set of notes. And here are, This is the uh, animated overlay of the watermark found in those two sheets. And as you see this, watch very carefully for certain points um, that, that have been measured in, in the eagle. And I think you'll be convinced that we're talking about the same paper making mold. In the first 30 pages, of Arendelle, that discrete notebook created by Leonardo, which was then added later. Here we see the Cardinal's hat um, morphing into another sheet found within that first 30 pages. And I think you'll find that um, they were formed from the same paper making mold. We have found um, 
mold mates scattered throughout the rest of the Codex Arundel. And here you see what I call the loco bull uh, that is found in these later sheets. And note, though, that, that these sheets are not next to each other. It's as if people, as, as if the collector just took all of Leonardo's products, threw them up in the air, and then combined them together. And finally, we found what we call these cross codex um, mold mates. Um, going back to the collation diagram of the Codex Lester, you may have noted um, that there was a single sheet uh, watermarked with an eagle and five sheets having cardinal's hats. Um, they reappear in the Codex Arundel as identical papers formed from the same mold. And here you and here you see the cross codex eagle. Their mole status can be confirmed by watching the looping video overlay of the denoised watermarks. And this suggests that Leonardo was either working from one ream of paper and that folio 66, 67 became separated from that batch and was reinserted later, or that perhaps another ream of paper was purchased from the same paper purveyor and the same mold continued to be used. Whatever the case, we can say with confidence that these two papers share a specific, a common geographic and a, uh, origin and a narrow date of production. A cross codex mold was found between Arundel 208 and 209, that's the, the um, yes, the two sheets, Arundel 208, 209, and five of the Leicester sheets, one ass, did the Arundel sheet get separated from the batch of paper used to compile the Lester one? Compile the Lester? And one intriguing feature, though, is that I would ask you to look closely, is the way the text and the diagrams are laid out on the sheet. In the Codex Lester, which is a larger, it's a bifolio, um, Leonardo used each half and arranged his writing and inserted his text and his, his observations in a vertical format. The Arundel, actually is folded in half, and normally the text and the illustrations run this way, horizontally on the sheet. But in this particular case, these are cross-codex mold mates. One wonders if, in fact, these two sheets were originally laid out and recorded by Leonardo at the same time that he um, created the Codex Lester. And here's the, uh, the visual overlay, the animated overlay of the cardinal's hat. So in addition to the mole mates found in the Leicester, the Arundel, scattered throughout the Arundel, shared between the Leicester and the Arundel, there's more. We now have expanded our search, and we've discovered mole mates exactly identical pa papers shared between the Codex Lester and drawings in the Royal Collection. As an example of the uh, Codex Lester, um, the, this sheet, sheet five, and you'll remember what sheet five was? No, sheet five was an eagle. No, sheet five, ah, yes. Do you remember what sheet five? Sheet five was that fleur de lis, the fleur de lis that I told you to keep an eye on. And here it is. This is the one from the Leicester. Remember, it was totally out of context. And the fleur de lis that's found in the Royal Collection. And I want you to know that these images were downloaded from the Royal Collection Trust website. These were not specially, it's public, public information. Go to the Royal Collection website, you'll see a little um, transmitted light photograph of this drawing, you can download it. We downloaded it from the web and compared it with ours. 
the Arendelle uh, cross cross collection cross collection uh, mole mate um, is found um, in this drawing on your right. Uh, the horses um, sketches of the horses. This was also downloaded from the Royal Collection Trust website, and the watermark is St. Catherine's Wheel. It is a very distinctive St. Catherine's Wheel in the fact that one of the blades, typically it would have six blades, one of the blades um, appears to, to be missing. So what have we learned? We learned that there are 48 mole mates found in and between the Codex Lester and the Codex Arendelle. I believe this supports a historic connection between them in terms of dates and common paper sources. Um, by sharing this info with scholars who are studying the marks made on the sheets themselves, perhaps they deserve a second look. Perhaps more indications of affinities can be found. The mole mates occurring in close sequence in the codices themselves support the theory that the papers are from one paper source or one ream and therefore form an even narrower range of, period of time in days and weeks. And I think that this theory can support new collation theor theories. The isolated and the scattered mole mates within the codices and the cross codex mole mates between them can only be dated to a broader but still quite narrow period of time, and that would be the lifetime of the paper mold itself. But again, you know, textual evidence may suggest connections between them. Additional mold mates in other collections um, may be found, and they too may suggest additional affinities between now separated sheets. And finally, what can Leah Code reveal about the treasures that are here? in the Harry Ransom Center. Um, you are welcome to go to our website and um, download the free uh, um, software. Uh, before we do that, I want to just mention that if you're interested in Leonardo's papers specifically, there's an upcoming symposium at the British Library, a uh, two-day symposium, uh, which will consider the um, only his papers. Finally, I want to thank uh, the people and organizations listed in this slide. And I wanted to make a special shout out to the Manil Drawing Institute because that's the reason I'm here. And I encourage all of you to take a trip to see the wonderful Robert Motherwell show, uh, Drawing as Fast as the Mind Itself, which closes on March 12th. And now, if there's time, I'm not sure what the time is, we can visit Leopold or I can take questions. <laughs> Ellen, what do you want to do? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. That's a good question. Um, that is well beyond my area of expertise. I have certainly heard uh, of spore analysis, and I have heard it applied. Uh, to works of art. Um, these molds were scrubbed down every night um, and washed. I don't know how continuous the mold, the spore population would be. I don't know if that would disrupt the, the spore population. But, but surely all that water sitting in a vat 
all that time. I mean, have you ever smelled a paper making mill? <laughs> I would think that this spore population would be quite high and very distinct. Okay, both the Codex Lester and the Codex Arundel are disbound. So we do have access to the full sheets. The Arundel was a quarto, so the watermark was actually in the gutter. Uh, so in certain instances, the sewing lines have really interrupted the, the watermarks. Um, obviously, the better you can image your watermark, the, the better. I, I mean, the more extensively, I should say. But it is possible with fragmentary to go to these other programs and back it up. Yeah. So perhaps. Right, yes. Um, paper historians have spent a lot of time studying uh, consumption rates. Um, but that does not tell us how long a ream of paper would have lasted in Leonardo's studio. That we don't know. Now, what we can say is the paper was expensive. Um, it wasn't purchased in huge quantities. Um, so we know that it's not as if a huge quantity of cheap paper was sitting in Leonardo's studio and that he could afford to just let it you know, deteriorate, whatever. Um, we also don't know, uh, Leonardo traveled. It's not likely that, because paper was very plentiful, it's not likely that he took his paper with him. And we tend to see this in France uh, the, the works that he produced in France generally have French watermarks. So the evidence suggests that Leonardo bought his paper locally and consumed it locally. Because um, we're not seeing any uh, northern, northern Italian watermarks showing up in the French period. So that kind of tells us that he used up his paper. But of course we never know. We, we don't know. Um, maybe, maybe he put a, a couple of rings in his valise and, and took it with him. I mean, this, this we don't know. Yeah. That is a great question. Um, you, you, yeah. For that, you need a lot of papers, um, a lot of identical papers, a lot of identical papers. I think the most mold mates we have is of the same paper is 10 or 12. And I don't know that that would give you the chain, the, the length of time. You definitely see damaged molds, but putting that into context in this project is not possible. But if you had an unopened dream of paper, you probably could, by the chain, by all these software programs, you probably could trace changes. Our degree of tolerance from one ratio to another is, is 0 0.1. So anything that falls within that, that degree of tolerance is considered to be um, identical. But that's another reason why we made the animated overlays. Because people don't believe that. So, 
<laughs> so they want to see it. They want to see it for themselves. They want to study these automated overlays and make the decision, decision themselves. And that is precisely why we made them. Um, because it, it calls upon the close looking skills of the curators and the scholars and the conservators. And I think all of us value those skills very highly and we value them a lot more than a charm. So it's, that's why we've made those animated over. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. The question is, were any of these papers um, attached to backing boards? And, and what was the impact of the removal of those papers from the backing boards and their subsequent restoration? How, how might that affect, is, if I'm understanding the question um, correctly? Um, you may have noted in, in some of these that, um, well, not in the case of the Codex Lester, because the Codex Lester is actually in excellent condition. Um, there are a few tear repairs. Um, there's one small, very tiny fill. There's a one small corner that's been filled. The Arendelle has been from sheet to sheet um, treated with fills, with some of them have ra rather large fills because clearly these papers were damaged at, at one point. There's burn marks, um, there, there are losses, there are tears, there are losses in the corners. Um, they've all been filled. The Codex Arendelle was never mounted, um, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the Codex Lester was never mounted. The Codex Arendelle, I don't believe was mounted, but it was disbound and each sheet was restored. Now, the restoration is not enough to change the internal structural features of a piece of paper. And we tried this out ourselves. We took um, a collection of 16th century papers and uh, did all the, the chain line, watermark, uh, we didn't do laid line. And we washed them, and we flattened them under weight. And it wasn't enough to change the internal features. That's because we know paper expands, but it's the ratios. We're measuring ratios. Uh, so the ratio of what, assuming it expands equally across the sheet, of course, um, we're comparing the ratio of one line to the next line to the next line. So even the washing and the flattening under weight and I even sent one through an intaglio press, um, wasn't enough to significantly alter those three markers. 